Hello, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby here with Emmy nominated visual effects supervisor Grady Kofer of The Mandalorian. And congratulations on this Emmy nomination. Grady, oh, uh, thanks for sitting thank down you. with me. Um, you know, many series, I think the visual effects team would probably be working mostly in post production, but I feel like with the use of stagecraft for the Mandalorian and the volume screen, you all probably have to be starting this process much earlier. So can you describe yeah. what that the early part of that process is like? Yeah, it's um it's actually thanks, thanks for that. It's very true. This is a it's a different animal, right? Because this is a big virtual production and uh, it's something I really enjoy. It actually means that it plugs visual effects and animation kind of into the process pretty much from the outset. You know, the first thing I ever see are the are the scripts. Um, as soon as John, you know, he he finished all these uh, the scripts and 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 uh, and Noah for this season, so you know the first thing you're reading is just on the page, and you get to kind of visualize everything, and then of course at the same time you have uh, Doug Chang's super talented art team um, working, and they they take each of those stories and they start making these beautiful concepts. So, you know, they create these presentations called dreamscapes. And so we'd sit there and review things with John and just hearing kind of him, hearing John kind of tell the story from his perspective. And meanwhile, kind of looking at all of these images uh, from, you know, Doug Chang's team, it's it's super inspiring. You know, these, these uh, images are quite soulful. So from even from the outset, um, we're already starting to think about, okay, uh, these are great. Um, this might be a great application of stagecraft technology. Maybe this is something that we could actually tackle kind of early on, or maybe not. Maybe this is just a, a huge sequence. You know, we're fighting um, a big turtle monster in a lake <laughs> outside. Uh, it's going to take a year to plan this. You know, I mean, I actually really enjoy tackling those kinds of um, like set pieces as well, because you have to, you know, all the logistical questions come out like, uh, do you have to shoot in water? You know, do you do you need a, a a physical representation of the creature there? Are you using stunt people? That kind of thing. So you know, you, even even in that case, you're starting things very early on. But certainly in a virtual production, you um, not only do you need to wrap your head around things, you actually need to start building things kind of from the outset. So that um, a lot of that falls under. Uh, Andrew Jones's team, right, our, our production designer. So he has his virtual art department, the VAB, and they're super talented and very, very quick. So they start creating um, lots of models and lots of environments inside of Unreal. And we kind of go into VR and we can scout those things. And we did this a lot and we do it with John, we do it with the episodic directors, uh, we do it with our stunt coordinator. We go into VR and we actually kind of walk through these sets and we talk about maybe the ways we might want to shoot it. Um, all of that then feeds previs. Well, while we're in there, uh, usually that's the best time to kind of make a case whether or not, hey, this is like, this is a great um, opportunity to build this uh, in in uh, virtually and have it in a real time engine and have it play back on the, on the volume wall. So we did that many times. You know, this season we had about sixty um, loads. But in general, we were far more kind of selective with what we chose to shoot uh, in, in, in stagecraft. I think we've learned a lot over the years about what works best um, using that technology. So we tried to uh, to you know use it where um, where it could really shine. You mentioned the episodic directors. I was wondering, does that mean you have to kind of change your initial process with the director you're working on because, say, Bryce Dallas Howard wants. Uh, something that maybe Carl Weathers works a different way? Do you have to switch it up each time? Absolutely. And that's actually kind of one of the great joys of this show is being able to work with so many um, different episodic directors that have different experience, um, different aesthetics, different, different points of view, different stories to tell. Of course, it all kind of, it, it's guided by by our creative team, by by John Favreau, by Dave Filoni, Dave Fukuyama. So you have a team to kind of pull it all together. But yes, it's actually one of my favorite things as a visual effects supervisor is kind of uh, getting on the wavelength of your director, you know, figuring out how he or she likes to work the way, you know, they want to tackle um, a story and then helping them tell that story. It's really, honestly, it's, it's why I do what I do. Because to me, it's, 
it's kind of all about the people and the collaboration. And when that works well, and, and John fosters that, he actually builds, he built the whole show to kind of foster that. When that works well, to me, it's, it's, um, it, it, it takes all the work and it really elevates it. And I think it's really one of the, uh, one of the reasons why the show has been so successful. Well, I think this season, uh, there, there's a lot of great visual effects heavy moments in the season, but I think one of the most talked about ones was probably the flashback to Order 66 when mm -hmm. Grogu is rescued. We finally get the story there. And it's interesting because the Mandalorian has its own visual identity within the Star Wars visual identity. But now we're going back to the, the prequel trilogy right. era. So how do you create that digital world going, you know, capturing that aesthetic while also making it seem, you know, it's from a current show? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, Coruscant has such a rich history, like you say. And for us, you know, I come to this show as a fan, right? There's really nothing like working in the Star Wars universe. I love it. Uh, and and all of the, the crew that I work with at ILM feel, felt the same way. And so they really wanted to honor that history. So, um, and many of them actually worked on prequels, including myself, I worked on Attack of the Clones. So we, uh, they started this process where they actually brought, they brought back all of the original buildings and, um, and vehicles from clones and from Sith, like from the, you know, from the prequels. And they started this process of like kind of upgrading them and and like up them and stuff. And then of course, at the same time, we were building unique buildings, working with Doug Chang's team and things that could really hold up close to camera. But we wanted to honor that. We wanted, we wanted the audience to feel like they're being taken, especially since it was Order 66, right? It wasn't just Coruscant, it's literally a flashback into Order 66. So we wanted that, that we, we wanted the audience to feel like they've been transported back to that kind of that kind of a magical time, but that kind of horrific event to kind of the history of, of, of Star Wars. Um, so it was it was a big endeavor, but it was it was kind of a joy to do. And that shoot, you know, um, that was uh, Carl Weathers, who's <laughs> I love working with Carl, you know, especially um, working with Carl and Dean Cundy on on the previs. You know, Dean has such a uh, he's such a visual storyteller, you know, and and. Star Wars is kind of the pinnacle of visual storytelling, but he has, you know, his his experience and stuff. He knows how to tell a story just with camera. So that was really interesting. And Carl is, is a very good actor and has really a really good sense of kind of the emotional kind of content of a scene. So seeing the two of them work together um, was just really, it was fun for me. It was kind of, a, it was just a, an educational experience. But then being on that set, so we shot it in many different ways. We had um, parts of it once, Grogu goes down the elevator and those elevator doors open. Um, the, the environment, we shot that um, within the volume. So you're actually seeing kind of Coruscant back there in the distance. The, uh, and then of course we shot also on a motion base, you know, so, um, so his rescuer, the Jedi, uh, which was amazing. He, he was kind of actually fine flying on a motion base. And, and we, had, uh, we had a lot of lights and stuff to kind of represent um, his speed. So there, there was a lot of thought went into that, uh, into that flashback. And I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Yeah. Well, speaking of Grogu, I was thinking about kind of the mix of practical elements within this very virtual uh, production, because there are a lot of practical elements. He's probably the most obvious example. But how hard is it when you have to then kind of uh, digitally augment a practical character hmm. or element like that? Like, I assume maybe you are, maybe you are catapulting Grogu to uh, the puppet to, to make him <laughs> leap, but I'm assuming it's a digital uh, effect. So how do you, how do you get that right when you have to augment that? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that kind of um, speaks to the overall philosophy uh, behind the visual effects for this show. And a lot of this um, come, comes from John. And that's to definitely to aim for the, the highest level of computer graphics and animation, but then to really balance that with all the old school, more traditional techniques, you know, the uh, model miniatures and animatronics and, and, you know, practical creature effects and, and puppeteering, right? Like Rogu. And I think um, originally kind of like in the first season, and this is, this is my first season on the show, but in early days, I think the assumption was, yes, we built this puppet. He looks great, but there's going to be a lot of enhancements going to be digital. Most of the time, he's not, it's going to be a lot of limitations. Uh, but to be honest, 
once, I mean, and this is, you know, legacy effects get out there and there are these brilliant um, puppeteers and they have a great sense of character. And once everyone saw how Grogu could move and could walk and could emote, um, they loved it and John loved it. And then it, it turned into, let's not change it. In fact, if, if he had written something that Grogu couldn't do effectively or didn't look realistic, he'd say, let's change it. What can he do? Well, actually, maybe he could he could scurry across the ground and climb up with his hand. Great, let's do that instead. So you'd be surprised how um, how often it really is Grogu, even flipping through the air. We, I mean, we shoot everything. It's actually our, um, our, our we, we push for it. Our philosophy is no matter what, try to get a take with Grogu in there, let the puppeteers do their thing. And then if, it gets through editorial and John and Dave start feeling a certain way about things and we need to get in there and maybe enhance something. Of course we will, but we have a very light touch about it when we do. That's awesome. Uh, I, I was actually, I was looking through your resume and I noticed in many past credits, you have the title of Inferno Supervisor. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm thinking that maybe helped you uh, during the big finale sequence when Grogu is protecting Bo <laughs> and Mando from <laughs> the fire yeah. of this huge starship that's uh, crashed down. What was working on that sequence? From my like? experience working with fire, yes. So <laughs> yeah. the, I was a, um, by trade, I was a compositor uh, and, and I worked with Flame and Inferno, which were these old like high-speed um, compositing tools uh, and still are. And so I, I spent years at ILM, including a couple Star Wars shows doing, you know, comping work. And it definitely, that, does inform a lot of what I do, to be honest. Like I, I come to things from a com with a compositor's aesthetic. Um, the big thing, though, with that finale, um, it it uh, everything led up to it, right? It was such a weighty moment. And actually, you know, John does this very well. But the um, we had to tell multiple stories at once. It's one of those things where you have this uh, massive dogfight happening above, you know. Um, actually outside of the upper atmosphere of Mandalore, you have this epic kind of um, dogfight of jetpackers, right? You have the Mandalorian jetpackers and you have these new kind of uh, super commandos that are flying around in this massive cavity uh, underground. But then you have the smaller fight, right? Which is Bo and Mando and even Grogu taking on Moff Gideon. And so having balancing between those is is a bit of a trick and of course a lot of that falls to editorial but we kept kind of referencing return of the jedi which did it very well you had you know luke you know uh with vader and the emperor and meanwhile outside that window you saw this kind of space battle happening and they were very successful in kind of uh, bouncing back and forth and telling both of those stories going from kind of broad back down to the personal but in this case um it went very small, right? All the way down to uh, really the focal point, the one that kind of holds everything together, which is Grogu. And to me, it's like, it was, uh, it's a beautiful little moment. And there was a hint of this in early, in, you know, in an earlier season that he's, he's being able to harness his powers in this way. But the fact that he can use his powers to actually protect his, almost like his newfound like family is very touching. Um, and the musical score at that point, I'll just point out is beautiful too. Like it's, it's uh, you know, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of tears. The first time we actually, because when we present our work, we present it in context. There's no like, here's a shot. You know, John wants to sit back. He wants you to play. Everyone's quiet. You turn off your mics and you watch the entire scene. Because to him, it's more about how it makes him feel, how it might make the audience feel. Are we communicating these the, the correct ideas? Um, and from early on, especially with that score, we knew we, you know, we were hitting the right note uh, with with that with that shot. Mm. Well, you uh, you've worked with with ILM for for quite some time, and uh, you know you said you go all the way back to the Clone Wars. Uh, I'm curious, from your perspective in visual effects, what's kind of been the biggest innovation if you look back to that period, and how has it helped you on Mandalorian? There uh, there have been a number of big innovations. You know, the tools keep getting better. Uh, the boxes keep getting faster. So what used to be, uh, you know, shots that were so incredibly complex that you could barely render them, that rarely happens anymore. So um, to me, the the tools have kind of caught up a little bit with our imagination, you know, like 
if you can if you can think it and someone could kind of paint it and you're like that's what we want to do the tools are out there to generate it i think the the uh like for world building the terrain generation tools we used a lot of gaia um, this season so when you're flying over we call it um the you know the initial planet where we find uh, the Mandalorians the the covert planet where they are kind of you know by that lake when you're flying over that yes we had shot you know uh, plates at Lake Powell and stuff but all that's you know that's terrain generation that's that's using uh, those are simulated environments that use you know erosion and time and water and all this stuff and it kind of generates this environment it's quite beautiful so um, yeah the tools have have just have come a long way and now i think it's 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 not just about uh making pretty pictures it's about are you telling a good story and are you you know uh if you're lucky is that image that you're creating lasting and and if you're really lucky maybe you've even moved the audience in a way cuz you know and 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 caused a an emo an emotional reaction um because at the end of the day that's that's really what it's all about mm. Well, you certainly had a reaction with some people since you've scored uh, your first uh, primetime Emmy nomination here. How does that feel when you see your name on the the ballot for the first time when it's on that list of nominees? Oh, it's really exciting. Um, you know, I, honestly, I'm 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 thrilled. Um, I, it's not something that I take for granted. <laughs> you know, um, it's certainly a testament to Mr. Favreau. You know, and his his creative leadership. But it's also in large part due um, to the visual effects crew. You know, the the team I had on this show, they were they were so uh, passionate and so so dedicated. You know, day in and day out. So I'm super happy for them because um, it's really. I mean, you know, it's a team effort. It's a huge team. It's a village of people, and they're all so talented. And and uh, there are so many other soups in the mix as well. Like my and you know Paul Cavanaugh and Hal Hickel. I mean, there's the brain trust. There was amazing. So, um, but yes, you know, I, I, I love working in the Star Wars universe and, and uh, I'm very, I'm very proud to have contributed a part of this part to it. Well, congratulations again on your nomination, Grady, and, and thank you so much for sitting here talking some Mando with me and everyone who's out there watching, subscribe to Gold Derby, stick with us throughout this season. Thanks again, Grady. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. That was fun.